First, I would like to announce the next uh, talk, next uh, week. Uh, the speaker will be uh, Robert Paxton, and uh, he will uh, speak about the host pathogen interactions and the decline of pollinators. Now to uh, today's speaker. Today's speaker is uh, Volmer Hockma uh, from Netherlands, but he works uh, uh, at the University of Umea in Sweden. Uh, uh, Volmer has very broad interests uh, ranging from uh, macroecology, ecological theory, uh, metabolic theory, and uh, his, I think, major publications com uh, comprise uh, detecting the uh, mode of uh, evolution from uh, molecular phylogenies. And uh, I met uh, Fulmer uh, earlier uh, this year uh, when he was uh, talking at the International Biogeographic Society uh, Congress. And I was, during this talk, I was somehow thrilled that he was, uh, that his ideas about evolution uh, reminded very closely many times by uh, Jaroslav Flager and I was really <laughs> shocked by it because I didn't know that there is anybody else in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, uh, that evolution is essentially frozen. And so today, uh, Robert will uh, speak about this issue. So, yeah, thanks, thanks, David, for the introduction. So, so indeed, I am in the uh, unique position to talk to an audience who has heard all of this before. Uh, so, uh, so, um, might there anyway still be anything that is unclear? Then feel free to to interrupt me. Um, I should also thank, uh, especially David, for for inviting me here. It's been really nice to. To, to see the city. Unfortunately, I have only one day, so I decided I'll come back some other time and, and spend a bit more time here. Uh, so now for, for the, uh, the seminar. Um, why do species not adapt but go extinct? Um, I felt that it would be appropriate to, to start a talk about evolution with, with Charles Darwin. So um, Charles Darwin was not a particularly bright student. That, that may come as a relief to, to many of you. Um, in fact, uh, Charles Darwin went to university, I, I think, when, when he was 16 years old, which was not uncommon in, in his time. And uh, perhaps uh, because of his relatively young age, he figured that there's a lot of other things you can do than studying at university. Um, <laughs> Yeah, now, now he was actually fond of something you may not think of immediately, uh, playing cricket. <laughs> he played actually cricket to the extent that they decided to send him to another university. Um, that didn't help her. So, so first he, he was in, in Edinburgh, I think, which at that time was, was a leading university. Uh, you can di discuss with the people in Edinburgh right now whether that's still the case today. But, but certainly, like, um, he had some influential teachers there um, that many students felt were very inspiring. Darwin didn't quite share their opinion, and he skipped most of their lectures. Um, so at some point in the, in the family, they figured that it might be actually better to let him do something completely different than they put him on board Her Majesty's ship Beagle and let him sail around a little bit rather than waste his time at the university, um, which had great consequences for how we view biology nowadays. Um, so one of the turning points, perhaps, in, in, Darwin's, in Darwin's ideas about, about biology, we can hardly call it evolution because it hadn't really come up yet at that point, was when he visited the, the Galapagos Islands and he looked at, at the species of Geospizza. Um, these species, of course, were unknown to Western science at, at that point. Um, Darwin realized that the species are distinct between the islands and that on each island these, these species seem to fit a particular niche. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this is a sharp big ground finch, Geospizza difficilis. Um, there are two islands on the Galapagos archipelago where this species has a very particular way of feeding 
that is not very well known to most people who know the story about seeds and the different sizes of the beaks. In fact, in those islands, these are called vampire finches. They drink blood. Um, they get the blood by keeping open wounds on the, on the backs of ma mainly, mainly the boobies that are breeding there. Um, which means that on these islands, they are not as, as like, vulnerable to the dry season. But on most islands, these species are, are kindly sticking to a diet of, of, of seeds. Um, and the, the beaks, of course, like Darwin, Darwin realized that, that offspring tend to resemble their parents in many morphological characters. That was very well known. That is, like Darwin was a member of the British establishment. He was particularly fond of, of pigeons and, and doves. And he knew very well the techniques that breeders would apply to, to promote the expression of a particular character in, in the species or in the race that they were interested in. And it, it's, he, he realized that in nature the same would happen. If you have a beak with, with certain dimensions, perhaps slightly thicker, that allow you to be slightly better at, at cracking the seeds that happen to be available on this particular island or in this particular year, then, then you will have more offspring. And those offspring, moreover, will tend to resemble you in this characteristic. So if this characteristic persists over time, the, the thickness of the seeds, then we may expect that that the population over time starts to develop a, a beak that, that fits the size of this particular seed in this particular island. Now, th that, was, that was an interesting idea, certainly. And um, Darwin also understood that, that over really long periods of time, this could potentially make species substantially different to the point where we would consider them as belonging to different genera, different families, or taxa of still higher rank. And that was Darwin's, Darwin's original idea, for which he should certainly have a lot of credit. Um, most people nowadays, except for certain circles in the United States, believe that theory rather rather like as Darwin proposed it, with very little modification over years. Um, the interesting thing is that very many people, except in certain circles in the United States, <laughs> also believe that, that uh, many species at present are heavily threatened by climate change. We take for granted for, for new, from newspaper reports that the climate change that, that we are ostensibly causing has driven many species to extinction and is driving many species to extinction right now. I believe that uh, David has just uh, informed the, the, the larger audience about that through, through the radio. Um, so so th this picture is probably familiar to you. Now, there is something slightly paradoxical. If natural selection is acting ubiquitously, and if species are so good at adapting, then why do they go extinct? I'm not saying that there is a necessary paradox there, but there is something paradoxical there that very few people seem to ponder about. So, especially in the United States, evolutionary biologists tend to proclaim that evolution is more than a theory. We know that individuals produce more offspring than is necessary to replace just themselves. Yeah. Those individuals will tend to resemble their parents. And everything else being equal, the individuals that are most fit in their environment will tend to produce, to survive and reproduce themselves. Evolution naturally follows. So they said that this is something that is so obvious that we, can ha we hardly have to discuss it anymore. This is more than just a theory. This is totally obvious. And then they will come with, with examples illustrating this. If it would be so totally obvious and so ubiquitous, then we may really ask why approximately 99% of all the species that have ever existed on this planet are by now extinct. 
there is something paradoxical there. So let's let's take a look at that. Now I would first like to introduce to you the concept of extinction. Okay. So extinction hasn't always been around, but um, in the late in the late 18th century, so around 1780. Um, a fairly famous person, Georges Cuvier, studied the fossil remains of elephants. Uh, here you see the fossil remains of a European mammoth. He compared these to remains of the Ohio animal, which we would nowadays call a mastodon, together actually with, with the President of the United States, who had a fond interest in, in paleontology and also the financial means to, to support a few excavations. Um, he compared these to the species, the existing species of African and Indian elephant. And it didn't, uh, it didn't require much to, to clearly distinguish these species from each other. He realized that the Indian elephant is different from the African elephant and that both of them are substantially different from the mammoth. And that the mammoth again is substantially different from the mastodon. Now these are large organisms. It seems incredibly unlikely that they would be hiding somewhere where we haven't seen them. So he concluded that at some point in time something existed that we don't have nowadays anymore. And he concluded that these species are extinct. And for that reason Georges Cuvier is often credited with, with like introducing the concept of extinction. Now certainly if he would not have done it, someone else would have then done it, but still he is credited for this, this discovery. Um, the reason why I'm explaining this is that much later someone else was also working on fossil elephants and that would have direct repercussions for Darwin's theory. So when Darwin finally, after many years, decided to send the manuscript in which he explained his theory of evolution for, for publication by the Royal Society, it, it was read simultaneously with the work of Alfred Russell Wallace, who had independently come to the same conclusions. Um, that event was a very low-key event. Just about nobody was present, and the people who were present were not in the least impressed they could hardly guess the impact the theory would have on broader society. Um, when Darwin sent around the first edition of, of his ideas, his manuscript, he sent it to several colleagues that he respected. Hugh Falconer was one of them. Hugh Falconer also studied in Edinburgh at the same time when Darwin studied there. It is not known whether they personally knew each other, but they certainly knew each other from writing. Darwin exchanged a lot of letters, correspondence, we would call it email nowadays. Um, so, Hugh Falconer was one of the persons who actually understood Darwin's theory. We cannot say the same about the people in Uppsala in Sweden, that's a nice anecdote. And that Stefan Ulfström talked, uh, talked about a few years ago. So, so Darwin actually sent a manuscript of, on the origin of species also to Uppsala. It is in the, in the University Museum there. And the people working at the zoology department were, were very interested in, in the idea. They were keeping pigeons on the, on the roof of the building and they decided to do an experiment in order to test Darwin's ideas. So they started to feed the pigeons with meat. <laughs> Yes, because they understood that if they would feed the pigeons with meat, just like the Darwin's finches were feeding on different food, they would start to see like more predator-like bills <laughs> in these pigeons. Those were professors of biology, right? Those were educated people, so they made an experiment. Um, now, unfortunately, we do not know the results of the experiment because the pigeons have a tendency to die rather rapidly if you feed them on the <laughs> So, so much for the experimental biology at the, at the physiology department. Uh, but, but like, it was a bright idea. Um, they, they did actually, they, they had some manuscript in which they expressed that they thought that they saw a slight tendency towards more curvature in the top of the bill, but it was not like really. Anyways, uh, Falconer was one of the persons who actually understood what it was all about. Perhaps he actually understood it a little bit too well, because this is what he wrote to Charles Darwin in a letter upon receiving the manuscript. He wrote, I am bringing out a heavy memoir on elephants. 
an omnium gatherum affair with observations on the fossil and recent species. One section is devoted to the persistence and time of the specific characters of the mammoth. I trace him from before the glacial period, through it and after it. Unchangeable and unchanged, so far as the organs of digestion, teeth and locomotion are concerned. And then he adds, because he knew that, that Darwin was fond of pigeons and doves, like Darwin was a member of the establishment, right? He needed to have that kind of hobbies. He said, now the glacial period was no joke. It would have made ducks and drakes of your dear pigeons and doves. So what he is saying here is, I have this species, this, this European mammoth, and it goes through dramatic climatic vicissitudes several ice ages, but the species doesn't change. It's totally obvious to me that this is a mammoth. That the, the organs of digestion and locomotion, they are unchangeable and unchanged. And then the species goes extinct. So he asks Darwin, how is that compatible with your theory? Yeah? Your theory kind of suggests that this species certainly should undergo a lot of change, right? Because the environment is changing dramatically to the point where the whole species goes extinct. How is this compatible? Now, the, the answer that Darwin, the, the reply that, that Darwin writes is very interesting. He, um, or I'll, I'll keep that for later. I'll, I'll say that this is what, what finally, like, so, so Falconer, of course, realized that species are different. And the difference have to come from somewhere. Like, how did these Indian and African elephants become different? So, so Falconer, in, in several like, letters later with, with, with Darwin, he, he points out, well, when I see them in the fossil record, they seem to be different already. I don't see them changing. They, they seem to be different already. Yeah? And, and then, finally, in the fourth edition of On the Origin of Species, Darwin acknowledges this. He writes that it is a more important consideration clearly leading to the same result, because to Darwin the main result was that species descend from other species, as lately insisted on by Dr. Falconer, namely that the periods during which species have been undergoing modification, though very long as measured by years, have probably been short in comparison with the periods during which these same species remained without undergoing any change. Yeah. So, so Darwin actually acknowledges explicitly in, on the origin of species in the fourth edition that species do not seem to change very much. They seem to change rapidly initially to remain relatively unchanged after that. Now, I'm sure you have heard that story before. <laughs> so um, um, this was not like, or there were several people discussing about this during the, the decades that followed. Um, I, I won't walk you through that literature. I just want to show you one thing that was written by, by George Gaylord Simpson in his, in his book, Temp and Mode in Evolution, which is still a, a rather like seminal contribution. He writes that the most important distinction between students of evolution is between those who believe that this continuity, and he means discontinuity when, when you see species arising or in, in a lineage, but, but like evolutionary change by discontinuity, that this arises by intensification or combination of the differentiating, pro differentiating processes already effective within a potential or really continuous population. So it is something that you already have and it just, just becomes intensive and you see a leap, and those who maintain that some essentially different factors are involved. Those people who say that there is something radically different here. This is not the same process. Yeah. And this is really interesting. He writes that this is related to the old. Yeah, this is in 1944. He calls this the old question, yeah. but still vital problem of microevolution as opposed to macroevolution. And so, so actually, it took him several years to write this because in the meantime, he was flying around in an airplane and, and like bombing people during the Second World War. But, but in the meantime, he managed to write a book together and then like right in the end of the war, he, he actually pushed that out. But, but it's, it's really interesting that already here he says the most important distinction between evolutionary biologists is between those who think that these discontinuities are just intensification of something that we already understand or whether there's something really different. Um, well, 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 we'll start from there. So uh, that, that was the book. And another part, to, this is a bit of a boring slide, a lot of text, I understand that, but, but I think that this is anyway important to put it in a, in a context. Perhaps the most important outcome of this investigation, I mean this book, yeah, 
But also the most controversial and hypothetical is the attempted establishment of the existence and characteristics of quantum evolution. Yeah? These are these, these jumps that he is talking about. And then he defines a quantum in, in a very useful way. He says a quantum that is in a sense more general than, but including the definition of physics, is a prescribed or sufficient quantity. The term is applicable in situations in which sub-threshold actions produce no reactions, but super-threshold actions produce reactions of definite, not necessarily equal, magnitude. And this magnitude being strictly the quantum that we are talking about. Yeah? So if you have sub-threshold actions, nothing happens. You just get back to the, to the situation you had before. But if you have something that exerts something that exceeds the threshold, there will be a rapid and, and like irreversible change towards a situation that is distinctly different and that is a quantum and he tries to establish the existence of quantum evolution. It's really interesting if you read the Wikipedia page about this book because it gives a totally different story about what Simpson attempted to establish and what he is writing himself. It's really interesting to know who wrote that Wikipedia page. Um, so then, then he, he writes a few like nuances about this, but, but I think that this, this puts into historical context the, that, that this issue was debated. And Simpson is such an influential book, even considers it the most important issue that there is in evolutionary biology around that time. Now, after that, the Darwin's theory of, of evolution, who so far has been largely hypothetical, and only to a small degree based on empirical evidence, gets much more of a solid mechanical base with the development of quantitative genetics in the earliest part of the 20th century. Especially people like Haldane and Fisher contributing with population genetic theory. So that the, like Darwin didn't have knowledge, didn't have understanding of, of genetics. Mendel had discovered the rules of, of inheritance, simple rules of inheritance, but he didn't publish. They, these results were not like widely known. Other people had also published a whole theory of evolution by natural selection, but also in some remote places where Darwin didn't know their existence. So other people had these ideas before Darwin. They were around. Darwin also acknowledged that later, but, but a solid theory of genetics was lacking. But by now, around 1950, there was a solid theory of genetics which many people believed could explain the, the theory that, that Darwin had proposed. So, so the, the discussion, the debate, Kring, Around, around the discrepancy between macroevolution, microevolution, this quantum evolution, that, uh, that got just more and more on the background. There were fewer and fewer people even interested in anything. And I like to, to illustrate that, like feathers were, were very long regarded as an adaptation to flight. Now where would they suddenly come from? Like if you have primordial feathers and you're somewhere in the air, you will, be you will certainly be dead by the time you reach the ground because you can't fly with them, right? But that didn't seem to pose a problem to people. The same thing, and this is a, an example that Steve Gould took up, are the tiny front legs of the Tyrannosaur. There was a hypothesis what, what these were used for. So, so the idea was that, that, that the Tyrannosaurs used these to, to tickle the females, to tintillate the females <laughs> before copulation. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not a female, so I don't know whether it is sexually arousing to be, to be tickled by a Tyrannosaur. That, that could very well be, of course. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's hard, it's hard to reject the hypothesis because we don't have the guys around, right? But, but, but it, it's very strange, like, why would the female Tyrannosaurus have these front legs? Like, could it be that the front legs don't serve any purpose whatsoever? That they're just there, right? Could it just be that, that they don't know? That, that really wasn't any part of the possibility. Everything had to have some adaptive explanation. And, and Gould uh, referred to that as the Panglossian paradigm, um, where, where following Dr. Pangloss from, from, from a, an old French, French like satirical novel, where, where Dr. Pangloss believes that everything is for the best. Uh, everything in the world happens for the best reason. And that was a little bit the view from, um, um, in evolutionary biology, like everything was just happening because it was good for something. Now, um, 
against that background, yeah, so these, these theories that, that Simpson still thought was really important, that had ended up very much on the background when Steve Gould and especially Niles Eldridge then came up with their theory of, of punctuated equilibrium, essentially just reiterating what Falconer had pointed out to Darwin. They just said that, well, this, this gradual change over time, we don't see it very much in the fossil record. And in the fossil records that we're looking at, new species appear like substantially differentiated when we see them and then they don't change so very much and they came up with with theories as to as to test that now many many paleontologists would say there's hardly something to test there right it's an observation but but evolutionary biologists came up with a lot of criticism against that because they did not want to believe it it was so much against ruling paradigm that they were finding all kinds of ways in which it would not be true um, for example that that you would recognize fossil species as you would you would like call them different species only if they are substantially differentiated right because if, if they just like gradually transform yeah then then there is no point where you say oh no it's one species now it's the other so you would never call them a different species well Gould reacted to that saying no but stasis is data if I see the same fossil and I can track it through several geological layers and it doesn't change well that's certainly based on data that's not based on, on, on interpretation of what is a species but people were pretty deaf to these kind of arguments so so this has been standing for quite a while as as a dilemma in evolutionary biology um, now when I started working on it I thought very often in science things are not black and white it's it's unlikely that it's going to be exactly like this it's unlikely to be exactly like that so so if we want to to model this in order to to say something meaningful about it it's probably better to get something of a combination of both here here you have some gradual change over time but you also have some rapid changes when new species emerge and and then we can describe this we can we can these fluctuations we can model them as brownian motion and then we have a parameter the rate of evolution which which determines how how like much these vary whether they just change a little bit or whether there's a lot of variation over time and and these these changes well we can just assume that it is effectively instantaneous and it, it is just a normally distributed amount right then we take the standard deviation of the distribution that's our rate of of evolution so it, it's relatively easy to to make this kind of of a model of evolution to to work with um, there are, however, a few problems because I use some modern techniques here. So, so we want to distinguish those. This is our model, and here every species has a different color. But that's, of course, hardly what we observe when we go out in nature. What we typically observe is just like the the structure of the phylogeny. Um, without all the, the morphology, like we don't have a fossil record that shows us at, at 100 year time steps or even 1000 years, that's just, that doesn't exist. So what we get is a phylogeny and we also don't know where these species emerge, like this one for example, like we don't observe the extinct species, we also don't see these kind of transitions. What, what you typically see in the biological literature is this kind of a family tree of species. So that is where we need a little bit of statistical inference. Um, because we want to, to infer the parameters of this whole system, but the only thing that we have is this, and then some trait values of the species that we observe nowadays. That's typically what we have. Now we, can, we can catch a few individuals, we can measure the trait values, we can take some blood, get DNA, make a phylogeny, but we don't have all of this. Good. So how do we do that? Well, first we take a phylogeny. This is a phylogeny of the tropical reef fish Naso. I took it because they're really very nice. They look very fancy. Um, you see here how the number of species increases over time. Like, if you don't see extinct species, then the number of species must always in increase over time. It cannot decrease because nothing disappears. Now, if you do a lot of mathematics, then the rate at which this increases, so the exact branching points in this tree, tell you something about the rates of speciation and extinction. Um, they don't give you exact values, I'll skip the math, they give you a posterior distribution. They give you an, an estimate with confidence regions. So here you have the speciation probability, here the extinction probability, and the relative probability is indicated by color. Um, it seems like a speciation rate of approximately 0 0.05 lineages per million years and very little extinction, but it could be 
that actually there was a slightly higher speciation rate and an almost equal extinction rate. So we get something of a of a uncertain estimate of the speciation extinction rates here. Subsequently, the mathematics on my open office does not render very well in a PDF, <laughs> which is actually very good news for you because it saves you a very boring equation. Um, <laughs> Because the same result is actually plotted here in the graph, and we are primates, so we are visually oriented. So we <coughs> like much more to see a picture than to see, except for a few of us who have a deficiency in the visualization gene, and they call themselves mathematicians. Um, but, but here, like what, what we actually do is we take the speciation and extinction rates, and then for every branch in a phylogeny, we infer the probability distribution of the number of speciation events that occurred here but that do not lead to any present day species. Yeah? So that only lead to, to species that are extinct by now. And if you have fairly high species and extinction rates, then that number can be substantial, especially for long and old branches. You can have a lot of splits from these branches, but there has also been a lot of time for these species to go extinct already. So these can hide actually quite some of these events. So even though we cannot infer them, we cannot see them, we can get probability distributions on how many of these events have been there. So then we have a phylogeny. We get estimates of the speciation and extinction rates from that phylogeny. With these, we get estimates of the number of hidden speciation events on that phylogeny. And then we just catch a few animals out there, or, or we, we like pluck a few flowers or something, and we measure the, the traits of these, of these organisms. And then we, we put all of that into a Bayesian framework where we continuously keep updating all the parameters that we do not know in what we call a, a Markov chain, a Monte Carlo approach. And uh, do I have a meaningful slide about that? Oh, and we can publish that? No. Um, so I, I'm, going to, I'm going to escape from this for a little moment because for the primates among us, I have a visualization of that. Good. So this is the Markov chain Monte Carlo approach explained for people who don't like equations. Um, essentially what we do, we have the phenotypic traits, we have the trait values of most of the present day species, not all, a few species here you see moving around. This is, this is the scale for the trait value. Uh, let it be body mass or tarsus length or whatever. Um, so for the extinct species, of course, we don't know the trait value. So, so these we're continuously updating. At the same time, we're updating the speciation rate in blue here and the extinction rate in green here. We're also updating the rate of Brownian motion in blue here and the standard deviation or the, the variance of, of these jumps in the phenotype when you get a new species. Um, we keep doing this, for, you saw a jump here, suddenly we're at 5,000 and then it ended. Um, we keep doing that for, for several days to get a really long MCMC chain and then we have gotten the posterior distribution of, of all the parameters that we didn't know. All the ancestral character states, all the rates of evolution. And then, of course, what we're interested in is, is especially Control L, right? Yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks, thanks. So as what we are interested in especially is of course the magnitude of these jumps relative to, to how volatile this, this is. Yeah? If this is not volatile at all and these jumps are very large, well then we have good evidence for quantum evolution, right? So um, it's not difficult to get the data to do this. Um, I will show you an example from mammals, like Leek van Weylen, uh, who was one of the few people contributing with new ideas to evolutionary biology. He asked, how and why do mammals evolve unusually rapidly? Well, uh, we take a phylogeny of mammals, which, which is, is available nowadays, and let's focus on, on two specific groups of that for which there's good data, um, carnivores and primates. We have really, really good DNA data, really good phenotypic data for these groups. Um, if you think that evolution is a gradual process, like Darwin envisioned it originally, well then it seems that primates evolve about three <coughs> times faster than carnivores do. Yeah, the, the mode of this distribution lies about three times higher than the mode of this distribution. And in that case, Leek van Weylen could have asked us, why do primates evolve unusually rapidly? That would have been a valuable question. However, if we take into account that there is a speciational component to evolution, 
that species can change rapidly when they merge, so we, we add another axis to that, then the estimates here, they are virtually identical. There seems to be no difference between those groups. The apparent difference only emerges because we assume that evolution is a purely gradual process. There seem to be no differences between those groups, which makes a lot more sense because evolutionary biologists wrote several papers as to why certain groups evolve really rapidly. But to me, it seems very strange that primates would on a global scale evolve more quickly than, than carnivores. Yeah, on a global scale, like they share the same environment, they share the same like other species around them. Why would one group suddenly evolve way faster than the other group? Yeah, what, what's the sense of that? But that apparently seemed to make perfect sense to most evolutionary biologists. However, if we take this, this other model, then there doesn't seem to be that kind of a difference. Now we can take that one step further because we have a phylogeny not only for birds, we have a phylogeny also for, uh, not only for mammals, we have also one for birds and they also yield very pretty pictures in the presentation. So it's really worth doing this analysis also for birds. Um, now, if we assume again that, that evolution is a purely gradual process, then this would be our estimate of the rate of evolution, right? Now, if we do it just like with mammals, if we assume that there, there is also a speciation component, that things can change rapidly when you get a new species, well then this becomes the posterior distribution. See that the estimate of the rate of gradual change goes down rather dramatically yeah, from here to there. This, this is approximately the, the modus. At the same time, you get speciational rate of change, which is approximately here. I will soon tell you what that means in, in normal words. Um, but, but clearly, like that, there is this shift, right? So, so it's difficult to, to understand whether, whether this estimate makes sense. If you translate it, um, it means that there is approximately 20% change in body mass. So when you get a new species of bird, very quickly after it emerges, it will be on average 20% different from its ancestral species. And the question, of course, is does that make sense, right? Now, it's, it's hard to say that on theoretical grounds because there is very little theory as to what might be happening around this. Like, Jaroslav is one of the very few people who actually pondered about that. So, so what we did is we didn't go to theory, but, but we, we said let's go and look at subspecies because they are either very recent species or no species yet, but they are approximately in that, in that area. So what is the distribution of subspecies body size ratios? This is our prediction. Yeah? If this is our estimate around 0 0.78, then this is the prediction for the body size ratios of subspecies. And this is the data. It's entirely independent data. Yeah? There is, we did not fit the black line to the red data. These are entirely independent predictions. So that suggests that we're not too far off with our model. Not only did we predict correct magnitude, but also the distribution. Yeah? So, so this to us suggests that yes, there is a punctuational component. Yeah? It's hard to neglect a 20% size change on average. It becomes even more interesting when we add mammals. Because we can do the same analysis for mammals, right? And um, if, we, if we assume that evolution is purely gradual, then just as Leek van Velen pointed out, then mammals evolve unusually rapidly. This is the estimate of their rate of gradual change. Look at the birds, they were here. Mammals evolve three times as fast. However, if we assume this model, where there's also space for speciational change, then they seem to evolve at this rate which is virtually identical to the estimate that we got for birds. So just like carnivores and primates seem to evolve at very different rates if you neglect the punctuational component, if you take it into account, the mammals and the birds seem to end up with very similar estimates because this was our estimate for the cladogenetic change in birds and this is our estimate for that change in mammals. Virtually identical. Now these are large data sets, about 3,000, more than 3,000 body masses for, for mammals out of 4,500 species, we have more than 6,000 body masses for birds out of approximately 10,000 species. These are huge data sets. Now, of course, we also looked at, the, at we, we didn't have subspecies data for mammals, so we looked at very recent species on the phylogeny. And here, blue is for birds, green is for mammals, 
and like the prediction for birds you saw, it's virtually identical to the observation. Yeah? So, if the question is, is there a punctuational component to evolution, then the answer is yes. Uh, and there's not so very much discussion possible about this because these are empirical observations. If we take this and we simulate evolution on the phylogeny, there is very little scope for any additional gradual change over time because then, then the variation in body masses that we observe would be just like way, way larger. Uh, so there is not very much that you can do wrong in this kind of analysis. How much evolution is that? Well, this is approximately half a population standard deviation per million years. Yeah? To all of those of you who thought that evolution could be really rapid, typical rates of evolution out there in the fossil record are approximately half a population standard deviation per million years. So if we walk out there in the forest and we catch a bunch of birds, then within that, that individual sample of birds, yeah, there is enough variation to explain a million years of evolution. Very, very few evolutionary biologists realize that. This is more the realm of paleontology. So, the answer to Leek van Weyden's question, how and why do mammals evolve unusually rapidly? Well, because they go extinct so often. Yeah, mammals go extinct very often. I, I have to admit, I don't really know why. It could be for very simple reasons, but mammals go extinct really often. And every time a species goes extinct and another species emerges, because they also, like they speciate, also very often. Every time that happens, you get the change. That change is approximately 20%. And that is something that is fascinating. Because if they would be adapted to the world around there, then if they emerge more often, if you have more species turn over, then you would expect that the change at every speciation event would actually be smaller. Yes, because the world for them doesn't change faster than the world changes for birds, right? So if they have greater replacement and per speciation event, you would expect that the change is smaller, but it isn't. The change is just as large, which suggests that the change has very little to do with what is going out, well, what is going on out there.